Want a great way to show that 1 equals 2? Just let a equal b and multiply both sides by a. Next, subtract b squared from both sides so we can factor both sides. On the left, we have a difference of squares, and on the right, we have a greatest common factor of b. We'll just pull that out. Now, just using standard algebraic rules, cancel a minus b on both sides. We have a plus b equals b, but we assumed that a was b to begin with. So a plus b means the same as b plus b. So 2b equals b, and dividing both sides by b gives us 2 equals 1. I doubt you believe that, but what went wrong algebraically? There's a hidden division by 0 in here. Since we assumed a equals b, then the quantity a minus b has to be 0. And we're not allowed to cancel 0 on both sides. We can't divide by 0, usually. Take a look at this picture. Notice it's a square set up in such a way that its sides are length a plus b. Meaning the area of this square is a plus b all squared. Also notice the area of this square is the area of the inner square c squared, plus the area of the four triangles, all of which have area one-half base times height. Both of these quantities represent the area of the square, so they must be equal. Maneuver things around algebraically by distributing and canceling. We get a squared plus b squared is c squared, and you've just proved the Pythagorean theorem. If I asked you to add up the first 100 natural numbers, could you do it? What about the first 1,000 natural numbers? Or just the first n natural numbers? A genius way of figuring this out is to write this sum backwards and add it to itself. So we would have twice the sum in question, and we'd have 1 plus n plus 1 plus n plus 1 plus n n times, since there were n natural numbers. Just divide by 2, we have a formula for the sum of the first n natural numbers and you can use it for the questions I posed you earlier. Did you know some infinities are bigger than others? Certainly there are an infinite number of natural numbers, but there are also infinite numbers between 0 and 1. And I say that there are more numbers between 0 and 1 than there are natural numbers. Let me show you what I mean. You can list all of the natural numbers starting at 1 out to infinity in order. Here's our list. Do you think we can do that with all the numbers between 0 and 1? Let's try. Here's my list. I'm assuming that it exists. This is all the numbers in between 0 and 1 in some order. But I'm going to create a new number. Let's change the first digit in the first number. Let's change the second digit in the second number. Let's change the third digit in the third number, and so on and so forth forever. This is the new number I've created. And it's not the first number because the first digit is different. It's not the second number because the second digit is different. It's not the third number because the third digit is different. It's not any of the numbers on my list. But it's a number between 0 and 1. And so we have so many numbers between 0 and 1, I can't even list them in the same way we can list the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. That type of infinity is uncountably large. 
Another great contradiction comes from trying to show the square root of 2 is rational. Let's suppose that the square root of 2 is indeed rational, that it can be written in lowest terms as the ratio of two integers. We'll call them m and n. Squaring both sides means that 2 equals m squared over n squared, or that 2n squared equals m squared. Now, if a number can be written as twice an integer, we call that an even number. And through this process, we just concluded m squared is an even number. But if a square of a number is even, the number itself is also even. Let's call m 2k, where k is an integer. This just means m is even. Now we can substitute this back into our equation. So 2n squared equals 2k squared, or 2n squared equals 4k squared, or n squared equals 2k squared. And this is just another way of saying that n squared is even. n squared is written as twice an integer. And so by similar logic, n is also even. How do we wrap this up? m and n are both even. They're both divisible by 2, and so their fraction m over n is not written in lowest terms, contradicting our assumption in the first place that root 2 is rational. And so, of course, we conclude root 2 is irrational. You might know that we have a few special ways to represent a few special functions. Here's a representation for e to the x, cosine x, and sine x. And if we throw in a little bit of complex numbers, i squared is negative 1, i cubed is negative i, and i to the fourth is 1, what do you suppose e to the i x is? Well, throwing it into our pattern, it would be 1 plus i x plus i x squared over 2, and so on. And if we simplify this using these rules for i, well, i squareds become negative 1, i cubes become negative i, i's to the fourth become positive 1, and that repeats as a cycle every fourth power. The super interesting thing is if we group the terms with the i's and without the i's, factoring out that i, it just turns into the representation for cosine x and sine x. And so e to the i x equals cosine x plus i sine x. This is known as Euler's formula. The best part about it is plugging in pi. That means e to the i pi equals cosine pi plus i sine pi. Cosine of pi is negative 1 sine of pi is 0, and you can rewrite this as e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. Arguably the most five important constants in mathematics, e i pi 1 and 0, all nicely bound up in one cute, beautiful equation. There are an infinite number of prime numbers, but do you know how to show it? Let's assume that there are a finite number of prime numbers. We'll just say that there are n of them, and we can list them in order of p1, p2, p3, all the way up to pn. Let's create a new number. Let's multiply all of our prime numbers together, p1 times p2 times p3, all the way up to pn. We'll take this number and add 1 to it. We'll call it capital N. Now, clearly this number, capital N, is larger than PN. And PN was the largest prime number, by assumption. So if we're bigger than the largest prime number, capital N is not prime. Hence, it's composite. Well, every composite number has a prime factorization. That is, every composite number can be written as a factor of primes. 
For example, 30, a composite number, can be written as 2 times 3 times 5, all of which are prime. So this capital N, which is composite, must have a prime factorization. In particular, one of the primes on our list must divide n. Here's the part where we really have to think. One of our primes divides n. And since one of those primes is in the list, p1, p2, p3, and so on forever, it also divides the product, p1, p2, p3, all the way up to pn. Since this prime divides n and the product of all the primes, it divides their difference. It also must divide n minus this product, which happens to equal 1. We're saying this prime divides the left-hand side, which means it also must divide the right-hand side. Our prime must divide 1. But the lowest prime number is 2, and 2 doesn't divide 1. This is impossible. Our prime number can't divide 1. We have a contradiction. Hence our assumption that there were a finite number of primes is wrong, and there are indeed an infinite number of primes. But what's even more amazing than any of these arguments are these numbers. If you haven't seen them before, they'll totally blow your mind. Click the video on the screen to check them out. I'll see you in that one.